example of what this could look like. Great. Is that my turn? <laughs> Is yes, that my cue? Okay. <laughs> well, great. Well, well, hello, everyone. It's, it's my pleasure to, um, to see, first of all, to see all of you, but, um, but also to uh, serve as, as the moderator for this panel discussion. So for those that I haven't met, I'm, I'm Deidre Cruz. I'm the deputy director of our center uh, here uh, at Center for Health Equity and also co-principal investigator along with Dr. Cooper, who uh, sends her regrets but could not be with us today because she's serving on an important um, committee with President Biden's administration uh, with some service today. Um, but um, together, she and I lead our Mid-Atlantic Center for Cardiometabolic Health Equity. And um, today, it's my pleasure to, um, to kind of kick us off with the next portion of our, our meeting together today where we're gonna have a, a discussion with some esteemed panelists who have um, deep experience around um, community engaged and community partnered research. Um, and we're gonna hear from them about sort of some of the, the, the key um, factors that have led to the success of a, of a program that they were all involved in. Um, so first we're gonna have Dr. Ibe, who you just heard from, who is the Associate Director for Stakeholder Engagement at the Center for Health Equity um, and is an assistant professor um, at our School of Medicine here at Hopkins in the Division of General Internal, General Internal Medicine. Um, she serves as the co-lead of the Community Engagement Corps for the MATCH um, Center and, and has uh, expertise in developing, implementing, and evaluating community health worker delivered supports uh, with the goal of reducing cardiovascular health disparities. Um, then we're going to hear, or we're going to also have on the panel, uh, Reverend Deborah Hickman, who you've also heard from this afternoon, who is the Executive Director for Sisters Together and Reaching Incorporated, and the co-lead of our center's Community Advisory Board, as well as co-lead of the MATCH Community Engagement Board. She has been a premier advocate for health equity among African American men, women, and their families. Um, and uh, she is an ongoing consultant for the CDC and is also an internationally acclaimed speaker. Um, and she's been a member of our CAB uh, for several years and, and certainly has a deep passion for supporting underserved communities in this area. And then finally, um, our uh, panel is rounded out by uh, Mr. Leon Purnell, who is the executive director of the Men and Family Center here in Baltimore, which is an organization that seeks to increase the accessibility of needed services and to build community awareness with the aim of reducing poverty and promoting justice for men and their families living in Baltimore, living in East Baltimore specifically and beyond. Um, Mr. Purnell is, a well, is well regarded for his longstanding commitment to creating social change and advocating for the needs of underserved communities. He's collaborated with students, faculty members, and university leaders across Johns Hopkins on an array of projects that um, have been geared toward reducing health disparities in the greater Baltimore area. So uh, in summary, uh, you're in for a treat. We've got some uh, wonderful and committed uh, experts in this area that we, we uh, are excited to hear from. So, so Dr. Ebay, we're gonna turn to you first. If you could sort of kick us off, tell us a little bit, what, what was the Tumaini Hope for Health program that we're gonna get to hear more about today? Yeah, um, thanks, Dr. Cruz. Thanks for um, welcoming us so warmly. So the Tumaini Hope for Health program was actually kind of the birth uh, child of two parallel initiatives. There was the East Baltimore Health Enterprise Zone that Reverend Hickman and Leon were actually helping to spearhead. Um, and then there was the Johns Hopkins Community Health Partnership, also known as JCHIP. That was a CMMI or Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Innovation um, demonstration project. So the Tumaini program was really a collaboration between these leaders of the East Baltimore Health Enterprise Zone and the JCHIP program. And in essence, Reverend Hickman and Leon as the directors of the Men and Family Center for Leon and Sisters Together and Reaching um, for Reverend Hickman, came up with this wonderful and pretty innovative idea of training a community-based workforce to help support JCHIP patients that live within what we refer to as the Tumaini catchment area. 
So there, it's a three zip code area right outside of Hopkins. Actually, not outside of Hopkins. Hopkins is within the zip code area. So 21202, 21205, and 21213. These are historically marginalized communities that are predominantly low income and black that STAR and the Men and Family Center had focused so much of their efforts to supporting. So the, the Men and Family Center had who they called neighborhood navigators. They, these were individuals who worked, who lived within zip code, I'm sorry, within um, census blocks rather um, in the 21205 zip code. The neighborhood navigators would go out and support, try to identify people's health-related social barriers and get them connected to the Men and Family Center. Um, what STAR did was that they trained community health workers who resided in that three zip code area. And those community health workers supported patients who, were, who lived in those areas and were part of the JCHIP program. Whereas the neighborhood navigators with the Men and Family Center were helping basically anyone within their block um, those who were part of STAR were really focused on um, Medicaid and Medi Medicare recipients that received care at Johns Hopkins. So it was a collaboration between these two organizations and Johns Hopkins Health System. And it lasted for about four, roughly four years. Is that right, Leon? And you're on mute, but yeah, you, you nodded. So I'm assuming I'm right. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thanks for that for that overview. So, so, uh, so Leon, um, if I may. Um, <laughs> so, so one of the things that was mentioned um, when when Chetima was just speaking a moment ago about kind of providing this overview on on community engaged research and and um, one of the things that she highlighted was the importance of facilitating. Uh, deeply collaborative, equitable partnerships. And, and so from your perspective, what was the extent of the kind of collaborative like communication that happened uh, with the community via, via this program? And what, what did you feel like uh, worked and what do you feel like could have gone a bit better? Well, I'm glad you called me first because Rev Hickman take too long when she gets started. Uh, so I'll, um, there were a number of things. The, the most intriguing thing was that Hopkins had, had truly um, entered into a, a legitimate uh, collaboration with community-based organizations. One of the first and one of the largest in their history, and that's terrible. But uh, what we saw was an opportunity to help the people that we help anyway in our communities, connect them to healthcare for hypertension and get them engaged. And at the same time, signing many of them up for healthcare. We had people that that in my that, that uh, entered my program that have been working for 30 years or more and never been able to afford healthcare. And when the Affordable Care Act came around the same time as JCHIP, we took full advantage of it and we tried to get everybody signed up for healthcare. And we did uh, such a great job that most of Maryland didn't match our numbers. So, you know, using people from the community to go out and get the information and connect community persons that lived around them or family members was the key to our success. Well, thanks for that. So um, I'm going to invite uh, Reverend Hickman in now, since you you had your turn. <laughs> so now she can have a turn. Yeah, so mm -hmm. so certainly both of you, though, really um, uh, have had a lot of experience with with building on the strengths and resources uh, within the communities that you support. And so, how, in your view, how should a partnership like the Tumaini program? Um, be able to, you know, sort of facilitate the strengthening of your capacity to do this work? Like how, what, what's the role of programs like this for when it comes to capacity building? Um, and, and when you think about that sort of what, you know, what sort of needs are there? Like what, what type of capacity should we be looking to build um, to sustain these sorts of efforts? 
you're you're on mute, dear Reverend. That, that's <laughs> not good. <laughs> you need to for those for those that are just meeting this um, uh, several decades uh, partnership between Mr. Purnell and Reverend Hickman, this is this is this is their standard banter. This is not new. This, <laughs> this, this yeah. is, uh, but 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 at any, at any rate, <laughs> Reverend Hickman, you have the floor. I can only say you needed to have been in the meetings with Leon and I. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> You really needed to have been in those meetings. There's the well, no funniest <laughs> meetings I've ever been in. <laughs> How I would answer your question, Dr. Cruz, is, is that in terms of building um, the capacity and the strengthening of our community-based organizations, it was first and foremost getting to know the community that we already, and communities that we already um, exist in and the ones that we don't exist in, but we're working in, is getting to know who are the persons that are the leaders in those communities? What are the issues, uh, especially health-wise, that they encountered? And how could we help each other? And how, I think the first thing was learning how to listen to the people in community, not go to the community with answers and saying, we're gonna do this and we're gonna get you better at this, better. Don't use words like that. Make certain that you're using language that continues to have them invite you in to their communities and feel confident that you are going to actually deliver the services that you stated that you were going to do. And they helped us in a way that we got to find the people that we wanted to first and foremost employ in these communities. And we needed to listen to them about what they knew about the communities that they existed in and how we should make an approach. That was one of our areas of building capacity for our organization is that we gleaned from the community leaders. We gleaned from those persons that Johns Hopkins assigned to us to knock on their doors and to be able to enter into their homes. But I think we also built capacity with the partnership with Johns Hopkins in ways by which we did not have the necessary IT equipment or knowledge base and the capacity to be able to make sure that we were capturing our data in a qualitative way that could be coded at the end and then put into the journals as they had been uh, has, as they have been since we joined forces with each other. And so I think that that strengthened us and gave us capacity, but at the same time, we also strengthened the community and we especially strengthened Johns Hopkins. And we did it in a way by which Leon has already stated some of it, but I think um, Dr. Cruz uh, stated the word sustain. And sustainability is something that we had to learn along the way of the do's and the do nots. I think the first thing, the first part of it is making sure that we really on both sides, the community-based organizations and the institutions actually understand exactly what the outcomes you were looking for that we were able to deliver them and making certain that we know knew how to really approach community that might've been like down on Hopkins about the things of the past and the like. And gleaning from that, we had to develop strength to be able to go out and to ensure that we were not there as cronies for Hopkins, but we were there as advocates for our communities. And we were going to get them what they needed and asking them also to further identify resources in their communities that we should engage and make certain that they that those things are um, made knowledgeable and informed to both Hopkins and other community-based organizations that we also sought out as well to inform of the services that we were providing. Wow, terrific. So, so Mr. Purnell, I wanna um, invite you in. To, so what, what from your perspective were kind of important um, aspects that, that, that really spoke to being able to kind of build capacity for the continued work, for example, that you, you continue to do at the Men and Family Center? Well, the, the biggest thing was the, the collecting of the data that Reverend Hickman mm -hmm. mentioned. 
uh, our finances were in pretty good shape. Uh, you know, we both had, uh, you know, taken care of our programs for some years. So that wasn't an issue. Uh, study funding was a big, big thing. That, that's always crucial to the survival of a program, the, the, the building of it. Um, the thing that I, I think um, we should never forget is that we took people that um, lived in the community and use them uh, to go out and get the information. They did more than Hopkins staff could do. That was the reason we were called to the table because Hopkins staff could not get the um, encounter forms completed. And we got so many of those things, it's, it's ridiculous. So uh, having people that, that, that uh, the community knew and and trusted pretty much and and organizations that they trusted uh really catapulted um the relationships with hopkins to a level that it had never been to before uh but i see that's been shot in the foot again uh so some things never die i you know Reb hickman had experienced it as many times as i but uh it's been an ongoing thing you you build things up and they tear them down. So, uh, you know, as fast as they help us build our capacity, you know, in the area of um, uh, data collection and, and, and actually analyzing it so that we understood it, uh, they tore things down by getting rid of the people that really, really saw a value in the community's uh, perspective in, in working together. So, you know, that's, that's been a, an ongoing thing with Hopkins and it, it didn't change. I was expecting it. I, it took longer than I thought. I, <laughs> they normally don't last that long. Well, that's a somber note. And I'm, I'm gonna circle back to you because I, I wanna, in a bit, because I wanna hear more about um, how can we, we build to try to prevent that to happen from happening in the future. Because I think, uh, especially since we're, we're going to be talking today about some new, new programs, new projects, and, and we certainly want to do better and learn from from uh, what's happened in the past. Um, so I want to want to come back over to you, Dr. Ebay. So so in what ways would you say that your experience with the Tumaini uh, program, uh, how, how did that influence the way that you go about conducting community engaged research now? And it's sort of especially when thinking about um, how it informs the way that you you um, work with partnering organizations? Well, for me, I would say that doing being a part of the Tumaini program was probably a crash course in community engaged research in a lot of ways. You know, I was really fortunate to be trained academically by um, Dr. Janice Bowie, who is a, here and part of the Match Community Engagement Corps, and Dr. Cooper. And I learned a lot from watching them, but to actually be a researcher involved with the project like this, it taught me a lot. You know, one of the things that both Leon and Reverend Hickman mentioned was that, in essence, this project was trying to leverage the strengths of all of the community, the partnering organizations. So I was kind of like formally brought in to help provide technical assistance, but I learned from this project how critical it is to really immerse yourself in the functions of a community-based organization or a community in general. So I learned so much from Reverend Hickman, from watching her, from being really kind of, I felt so embedded in STAR that people thought I worked for STAR. That's how frequently I was there and in communication with her. I wasn't as connected to the uh, Men and Family Center because I had another partner who um, Leon worked closely with on that end. But I think for me, what I took away from it is I learned how hard community-based organizations have to work to get things done and to be heard. And the, the responsibility that researchers and leaders within academic institutions have to really kind of identify and see what's going on on the ground really embrace the innovation that emerges from 
communities, a lot of which comes as a result of scarcity and just trying to, you know, navigate circumstances and, you know, make lemon lemonade out of lemons. There, there's a lot of original, there's just a lot of innovation that happens that CBOs are doing that we don't often recognize is happening. And we as researchers can think to ourselves, oh, you know, this is such a new model that we're creating, but CBOs have already been doing it. And we really need to be working with people who are experts in engaging with people who have kind of been historically marginalized and disenfranchised and to recognize that that expertise resides in communities. The other thing too that comes to mind that I really learned a lot from this experience from kind of a research and like a public health perspective, public health practice perspective is really thinking about sustainability at the onset of the program and understanding how each partnering entity defines sustainability. Sustainability might look one way for me than it might, than it does for Leon, than it does for Reverend Hickman. So really having a shared understanding of, you know, what everyone's expectations are at the front and being open to hearing those things and being willing to be transparent and frankly vulnerable. I think I, I learned a lot about that too. So a, a lot of the things that I've mentioned are not research, they're not like researchy, but it made me a better researcher to learn um, and to be so in such close contact and collaboration with Leon and Reverend Hickman. Well, thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Purnell, you're, you're being yeah. very polite and raising your hand, so I'll call on you. <laughs> yeah, Chidema uh, says something that's, that's real valuable. She, she did learn a lot and she learned to listen to what we really had to say. And I think that, that she's climbed up the ladder a lot easier because of, of that. And one of the main things that we tell people all the time is when you come into our organizations, listen first. You know, don't come in there with no predetermined uh, agendas and think it's going to work, work like that because, you know, people trust us for a reason. And when you look at participatory research, it always talks about building the capacity of the program that you're working with. It talks about having them in the positions for sustainability so that if you have to come back, you don't have to rebuild things all over again. But I often have to voice the, the, the displeasure of, of working with Hopkins because of that, because they don't maintain the relationships. Uh, they don't move people beyond their uh, uh, current state. And, and that's what throws the research back each time because you're almost starting from square one. So, you know, if they, they have the definition for community-based participatory research, but they don't follow it. So, you know, that's, that's the issue that, that needs to be addressed. So how, okay, so Reverend Hickman, I want to certainly invite you in for your comment, and I do want us to think about um, what would you, what would you recommend to, you know, how, how could this be done better? So you're speaking, you know, speaking of Hopkins, we are they, right? So this is your, <laughs> this is the group here, right? So, so, you know, what, what can be, what can be done better um, uh, to advance this work? So Reverend Hickman. So I think what could be done better is first and foremost, I wanna say that it's a yes and no for me to everything that Leon just stated. And I say yes and no, because I think for community-based organizations, it's for us to glean from the experience, how it helped us. And also then, you know, on the other side of that, why aren't we still partnering with you? And so I think that in everything that looks like you know, they dropped us off. It's like uh, going back and having a conversation, a gathering of the, you know, of the Ron Daniels and the Kevin Sowers to say, tell us exactly 
what we didn't do and why we are not still in the game with you because we did have at one point uh, Hopkins hired a capacity um, builder for us that we still communicate with and he did an outstanding job. They created a survey for us, for Hopkins to look at their strengths and weaknesses and for us to look at our strengths and weaknesses. We submitted and we turned those things in. Hopkins never showed anything. We don't know if it ever got done. And so are you really on board and being sincere? And those are questions that the community always had for Leon and I about really, they are not real and they don't really follow up and follow through. But we were out there marketing that Hopkins has made a massive change and a massive shift. And so in so doing, you know, I think as I look back, going back to, again, sustainability, that's a conversation on the front end as to you know what you hope to gain from this, what you would like to see us do. And we're telling you, these are the things that we're going to need to have in place in order to be able to deliver all of these things, meaning that we needed to have data, you know, analysts and and the like to our organizations. We needed to have a better understanding of, you know, the development of the information forms that we developed in uh, in large part because of Dr. Ebay, who helped us along the way. And uh, Patty Ephraim also helped us to put in place our policies and procedures. I think that it is a critical factor that we look at what the end should look like before we start working in the beginning. I think that it is, um, as of this moment, you have to have a heart for change. And so, I think Leon and I both had a heart to listen, to be at the table and to change, but we also expected to be listened and heard and not just heard, but listened to with a intent to actually help find solutions to what we were bringing forth and not leave us in a space where a community is saying, oh, so, uh, this project is the same as Hopkins has always done. And that is, is that, you know, they, they're like drug, uh, drug dealers. They get you infused. And then all of a sudden, as you're thinking you're on path, and then they say, oh, the project is over. It's been shut down. We got the information that we needed. The community should never be left in those spaces and places. And right now, not only did uh, Leon and I, our organizations uh, do a powerful job, but right now community health workers is the main thing that the medical systems are talking about. And we actually can, um, we can blow our horns saying that we demonstrated and an outcome, uh, the beautiful outcome was that we saved millions of dollars. And that was reflected on the evaluative team that they had that came and gave us a final, you know, analysis of what actually happened. We were hired and uh, to bring in community people, to train community health workers. We did that. We trained community health workers that got together with others that they went to, uh, to uh, Annapolis and got certification put in place and those types of things. And so we know what we're doing and how to do it, but don't expect us to be able to be and look like what the institution itself looks like. We cannot deliver reports as fast as you want us to deliver them. We cannot deliver you know, invoices on time. And so you criticize us for minute things instead of looking at the larger picture. And so there's some things that we need for Hopkins to really have a heart for wanting to be there and not you know, play jump rope, but we have to give kudos to the persons that may no longer be at Hopkins, but there were true leaders there and those leaders somehow or another, and we have no reason as to why they're not still there, but <laughs> what is happening now should not be happening. It, we should still be in partnership and long-term partnership. And also I would say, even go as far as asking the board of trustees to make certain that we have a lifetime of Hopkins because we know community, community knows us. STAR has been in existence for 31 years. 
Men and Family Center, I think the same amount of time. And we've done stellar work in community. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm going to take a moderator's privilege here for a moment. I want to um, invite um, uh, the broader sort of uh, attendees today to, 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 to um, add questions they may have to the chat. And while you all do that, I want to um, invite uh, Dr. Ebay in to, to, to sort of comment on, on your experiences here uh, surrounding this work. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, um, Deidre, because I, I wanted to, I'm, I'm so appreciative of what everything that Leon and Reverend Hickman said. And I agree with a lot of what they shared, you know, on, from a researcher's perspective, it was disheartening to see the, them go through what they went through. I think what it taught me is that in community engaged research and these kind of community academic partnerships, it's kind of easy to cast people as us versus them or to like hom homogenize, you know, organizations and think this organization is good and this one is bad when really these are part these are organizations that are made up of people all with their own unique talents but also motivations not everyone has positive motivations for even doing good work but those who really care um you know they exert their influence in positive and negative ways so for me i think along the lines of one of the biggest takeaways i had from my experience with tumaini is Part of why we're doing even these didactic trainings is to really build our all of our collective capacity to do this work so that community partners know what they should expect and can hold the researchers and health system leaders they work with accountable. And so that researchers and health system leaders and public health practitioners have a sense of what is appropriate, what should we be mindful of doing or not doing, What's, what can we institute that will prevent this kind of phenomenon that Leon and Reverend Hickman have spoken about from continuing? And I think, um, you know, I think that's really essential. And one of the things that um, I have valued both from Tumaini and being part of the Center for Health Equity is just that there does seem to kind of be a groundswell of people who are trying to do not only focusing on the outcomes of the research or in, and the outcomes of practice, but also the process by which it's done and ensuring that it's done in a respectful way. But I, you know, I, I agree with, with Reverend Hickman and Leon that again, there's a level of intentionality that needs to be in place when we embark on these types of projects. And we need to be mindful of the histories that we're entering into when we do this work. Thank you for that. Mr. Purnell, did you want to? Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, Reverend Hickel said we should glean from them. I think they should glean from us because uh, many of the things that they couldn't do, we did. And, you know, that's that's something that, that should definitely be taken, taken into consideration when you're looking at a partner. You know, if they can fill in those gaps and do the things that you can't even get started, that's a big plus. And I don't, I didn't gleam a whole lot from, from them because it was always a push and pull thing. And I didn't have a problem getting my invoices in or whatever, because Pam was a hell of a um, person in, that was uh, knowledgeable in that and she kept it on point all the time. The, um, the main thing that I think we, we got to also remember is that when you talk about um, going into the community, why is it you always want to go to, you know, go get somebody to start brand new? And it slows down your process, it slows down your effectiveness. So, and, you know, with the people that we had, they had so much trust in the community that it wasn't an issue getting information from people. They they called on us for everything. So, you know, it's it's sad that that they would let somebody like Linda and them go uh, for no reason. And, you know, I asked the question with Ron Daniels not long ago. 
and he's he's we supposed to have another meeting because I don't have a problem asking them because you know I feel that I bring to the table as much as they have. And I don't I don't doubt that for a minute because we earn the money that we get and we weren't getting a great amount. And I used uh, neighborhood navigators that were trained from the community that was underemployed, unemployed, or disabled. And I taught them how to get the information and how to, to record things. And that saved them a ton of money. So, you know, and that's a, another thing that they should have taken into consideration. Well, thank you. I think you you have all given us given us a lot to kind of to consider. I think you know some of the things that I will take from this discussion is certainly that um, that the you know the, the the actions of some in an organization can certainly color the view that 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 many of our um, kind of would be community partners might might sort of um, the lens through which they may see that organization. I think um, all of us as individuals are. Doing, trying to do our part and um, we'll lean on, on you to help us do it better. Um, one thing that I, I'll definitely take away was uh, when you said, Mr. Purnell, when you said, uh, listen first, people trust us for a reason. Um, that really, that, that, that struck me. Um, and, I, and I think um, that's certainly something that we, those of us who are engaged in this type of work and certainly learn from. So I see that this, we have a quiet group that hasn't put any questions in the chat, but, but I hope that these, these uh, conversations will continue when we, when we go out into our breakout groups and are discussing the individual projects. So thank you uh, for, uh, for sharing today, for sharing your experiences. Hey, that's, that's not unusual. When we present, we usually give enough information that we don't have a lot of questions. <laughs> okay, fair if enough. Could, if I could have just a few minutes. Coast. <laughs> If sure. I could have two minutes to just uh, uh, 30 seconds. Uh, 30 seconds. Yes, because I'm we're going to say <laughs> that, you know, there are common pitfalls that we should share with the group to actually send out to you all that um, I can't go through right now. And, but there are also their helpful practices that I've written down that we can also share and send out to you all because I think that what we're trying to really say here is, is that. Let's be authentic and be our real selves. When we come to the table, it's no us and them, it's us. And let's make sure that we are, a, you know, have equity and equality across the process. As the first.